Today we're going to look at market specifications for beef cattle and the syllabus dot point we're going to look at today is analyse market specifications for the product. Now analyse in the boss test verbs it means identify components and the relationship between them. Draw out and relate implications. So in this instance we're identifying what the market specifications actually are, how they're related and what the implications are if these market specifications aren't met, so why are they actually important? Um, market specifications themselves are the requirements to enter particular markets and are determined by what consumers and processors actually value the most. For beef cattle, they are, there's major and minor. Um, in particular, the major ones are weight, which is usually carcass weight, fat, sex, and age. Now the minor ones usually are for particular markets so these include breed, lifetime traceability which all cattle have now anyway due to the NLIS scheme, um, accreditation so whether they're eligible for European Union, MSA which is Meat Standards Australia or if they're pasture fed or grain fed, uh, their muscle score, their butt shape, HGP status which is hormone growth promotants um, meat colour and fat colour, which we've covered in a previous lesson, so I won't be going over in this one. Fat distribution and the pH of meat, again, which we've covered in a previous session. This graph here is quite important. It shows the different types of markets uh, and what their requirements are for the two main um, market specs, which are carcass weight and fat depth. So your local butchery, those sorts of um, domestic and trade as such, uh, they only require, they don't require big carcasses, uh, so they really only require 150 kilo carcass weight um, with a fat score of 2, so a depth of 2 to 6 at the P8 site, which is on towards the rump, and I'll show you in a later slide. Um, in contrast, the Japanese long-fed market, which are the ones that are put on grain for a long period of time and then processed, so they're high-quality Japanese markets. They really need to be up around the 400-plus kilo carcass weight and uh, with quite a bit of fat on them. So between score 4 and 5, which is 13 to nearly sort of 30-odd mil of fat at the P8 site, and then obviously everything in between. Dentition or age is particularly important. Um, there's actually two ways they can measure age. The first one is by looking at the teeth. The second one is by ossification, which is, for, we've spoken about it in another lesson, and is um, to do with the cartilage that's turning to bone in the spine, spinal processes. But a farmer can certainly have a look at the dentition and um, often... In live assessment, they'll look at the dentition as well. An animal that still has all its baby teeth <clears throat> is called a milk tooth. So that means they haven't actually had any teeth at all erupt. And usually up till about two years of age is when that'll happen. Once it's, a two -tooth, once it's erupted its first two teeth, it's called a two tooth. When it's got four, it's a four tooth. Six tooth usually, I don't know why that says seven there. Um, and then a full mouth or eight tooth when it's reached probably about four to five years of age. Now, dentition can depend entirely on the breed of the animal. Um, British breed crosses, uh, British breed cattle and crosses usually erupt their teeth faster than, say, Brahmin crosses. Um, here, like your first your two tooth there, this average age is about 24 months for a British breed and then 26 months for a Brahmin cross. But it can depend on nutrition as well. An animal that's not had the best start in life or has had a fairly poor um, plane of nutrition will erupt its teeth a lot later than an animal who um, has been on an even nutritional um, plane. So that's where they use ossification to actually check to see what the age of the carcass is, even if the teeth aren't always accurate. 
carcass weight in particular is very important, as shown by the graph earlier. Uh, we've got two, uh, it depends entirely on maturity patterns. So a British breed like this one here, which is a short horn, they are a uh, small framed animal. So because they're a small frame, they mature earlier. So they'll actually hit their mature weight earlier than, say, a European breed such as the Charolais here. So they're a larger framed animal and they'll hit, they hit their maturity later. So these animals will start actually depositing, the small framed animals will start depositing fat earlier than the large framed animals. So they'll actually finish earlier. And this graph over here is to do with um, the how, how tissue is actually deposited. So from birth, the first thing that's deposited is bone. However, as the animal reaches puberty, which is here, um, it'll actually start to lay down muscle a lot faster. And then as it reaches maturity, it'll start to lay down more fat. So this is what's called finishing. They're meant to actually have laid down a certain amount of fat in particular, um, usually for market specs. And then marbling comes last at the end here. Now, the reason carcass weight's actually important is because it determines the size of the primal cuts, which ultimately determines the size of the retail cuts. Um, and the other thing that's important is the, um, the processing equipment. So when they move to more automatic type processing equipment rather than manual labour, this is where the yield and the um, size of the actual primal cuts will become more important but it's it's more to do with the consumer like the size of the retail cuts is more to do with a um, consumer preference than anything else fat score is also particularly important uh, and that's measured in two areas so on the diagram of the cow down the bottom here it's measured at the carcass as a carcass at the 12th or 13th rib site. It's also measured at the P8 rump site as well, which is, um, yeah, just as I said, on top of the rump. And usually it's given a score 1 to 6 visually, and then the actual rib fat measurement is given once it's a carcass, and that's measured between the 12th and 13th rib. Now, fat is really important to stop the primal cuts from getting chilled, too quickly because if there's not enough fat cover, MSA requires a minimum of three millimetres, then the, the primal cuts can actually chill and they can, that can cause toughening of those really expensive cuts. So that's important and that's to do with nutrition. Now onto the minor specifications. Sex is fairly self-explanatory. It's really just whether it's a bull a heifer or a cow, whether it's female, or a steer. Now, usually steers will actually receive higher prices at market than heifers or bulls. Bulls are usually in their own separate category completely um, because if, especially if they've been working it actually uh, they develop a taint to their meat. Um, there is a demand for that sort of stuff, but usually the majority of mainstream markets is um, for steers or heifers. Now, heifers will usually get discounted um, on price, and it, they to think it's to do with tenderness. Um, usually it'll drop about five points in the MSA score if it's a heifer. Uh, now, steers are not supposed to have any secondary sexual characteristics and what you can see here the hump and this increased musculature like on the rump area um, in particular in the shoulder area they are secondary sexual characteristics so for some markets particularly like jap steers and that sort of um, thing they actually need to be either a steer or an entire male which is a bull with no 
no secondary sexual characteristics at all. And they can tell that by the actual carcass. Breed is another important market specification for some markets, mainly the export markets. So we've got two main types. On this side we have our tropical breeds, or also known as the Boss Indicus. And that includes Brahmin, um, Drought Master, those sorts of cattle with um, that have got the zebu content in them. Uh, and then our Boss Taurus breeds can be further split up into two main categories. We've got our British, which are our earlier maturing ones we've spoken about earlier, and we've got our European, which are our later maturing larger framed. Now, British includes Angus, it includes Shorthorns, Murray Greys, um, Hereford, etc. Our European main ones are Limos, uh, Charolais, and Simmentals. Now, in particular, our British breeds. So it depends, it depends entirely on the market that's actually being aimed for. Generally, a lot of feedlots in particular will prefer the British breeds or British cross European breeds because of their meat eating quality. So some offer premiums in particular for Angus cattle. Um, our short fed markets of less than 100 days on feed prefer the British um, because they're that earlier maturing type anyway. And um, some will accept comp composites of Boss Indicus as well, or crossbreeds of Boss Indicus. Some people use crossbreeding in particular because it produces hybrid vigor. Now, hybrid vigor is where, because of the combination of very different genes, a, um, a prog the progeny will actually perform better than either of its parents um, due to the lack of um, genes that cause like, decreases in performance that you get from inbreeding. So hybrid vigor is particularly hybrid vigor is a particularly important point. The now depending on the markets, um, so the EU market prefers these European type breeds. Um, something like the long fed Japanese markets actually need increased marbling, so they'll only accept certain British breeds. Um, such as the Angus, and yeah, some will pay premiums for them as well. Um, what they actually do is they measure the tropical breed content, so MSA in particular measures the hump height, and hump height, so which correlates to the tropical breed content, has a negative impact on meat-eating quality. Um, it's fine for the domestic and the supermarket butcher trade um, but it's not wanted in something like the Japanese long fed or any of the most of the feedlot markets where it's going to export. So they need superior meat eating quality. A lot of the the Bosidicus type cattle um, go into grinding beef, um, which is exported to the USA, so also known as manufacturing beef, um, or obviously a few go to live export in um, to Indonesia is the main live export destination as well. The butt shape is to do with the shape of the actual carcass butt so usually um, they, well, they score them from A to E and it's related to the muscle scoring and the amount of muscle on the animal's body and therefore the size of the cuts. Accreditations are also an important market specification uh, for some markets, so these could be Meat Standards Australia, um, for example, uh, which is the program for grading of beef on meat eating quality, which allows the use of the MSA labels. So you actually need to be registered, though, with um, Livestock Production Assurance first in order to be able to do that. 
So livestock production insurance or cattle care. Cattle care comes under LPA. They're an on-farm quality assurance program where producers must meet the minimum industry standards for beef production, which can provide access to markets. And auditing occurs annually with this. So you sometimes get a bonus if you're part of that. Uh, UCAS, European Union Cattle Accreditation Scheme. If you are to sell to the European Union, you need to be part of this scheme. So these, it guarantees full traceability, allows producers to meet European Union market requirements, which are for cattle that have never been treated with hormone growth promoters. Uh, the pasture-fed cattle assurance scheme, or the PCAS, it's for pasture-fed cattle only, so it improves the traceability of cattle that meets the minimum standards for pasture diets, and they also must be antibiotic and hormone growth promoting free, and then they're allowed to use these logos on the branding of the products when they actually um, market their products. GAPS, another one, Global Animal Partnership, Welfare. It's actually an international one, and it's a program that rewards producers for high standards of animal welfare, allowing the use of the labels. Hormone growth promotants are also important. These are actually little implants that they put inside the ear of the animal uh, that increases the, um, the composition of the carcass and their growth rate and their feed conversion efficiency. So these are either estrogen or they're estrogen and testosterone, depending on the sex of the cattle to start with. Um, and they have a negative effect on meat eating quality. They reduce meat eating quality. Uh, some markets, such as Coles Hormone, no added hormones beef, for example, which is a domestic market, and the EU, you can't use it either. So, but they do offer um, efficiencies with regards to feedlotting um, when it comes to increasing the amount of muscle um, increasing the growth rate and increasing the amount of growth with less feed. So this is actually a sample over the hooks grid for a, an abattoir. And as you can see down the bottom here, you get five cents on all prices for pasture um, accreditation. And uh, if you're certified PCAS, you are getting probably 10 cents above free range um, and you're getting... Even if you're Angus, just, just by breed, you're still getting um, 10 cents a kilo more than you are if you were just any other breed, essentially. So these, these accreditations can actually pay. You also get discounted significantly for bruising. Um, heifers in general get paid 5 cents a kilo less. Um, here it tells you that the free range premiums apply only to the hormone growth promoting free cattle. MSA Angus cattle must be a minimum of 75% um, and sign the contract. And yep, so these are some of the things that you can actually get paid on.